I do not own Star Trek, or any of the related characters. Star Trek, is a mark owned by Paramount. This story is a work of fanfiction and is for entertainment only. I am not making profit from this story. This is a tribute. All rights of Star Trek belong to Paramount. This fanfiction takes place between the second and third movies of the Kelvinverse. Star Trek Reloaded. Chapter 9 Tear. Mr. Eman. Admiral Archer looked at the man who sat before him. The man who had appeared out of nowhere and had turned his Enterprise into a helpless mass of drifting metal. Studied him for a long time. Good-looking, powerful, dark-skinned. Apparently in his fifties, maybe less. Definitely human or, at least, perfect in appearing so. Well, welcome aboard, mister. The man seemed to ignore his words, apparently more interested in looking around. They had him handcuffed and two security giants were behind him, ready for any eventuality. You don't really want to talk, do you? Archer sketched a smile, while he sipped a cup of lukewarm coffee. But at least your name and serial number I think you can tell me. In your time things don't work that way anymore. The visitor seemed to continue to be uninterested in what Archer was telling him, but the quick twitch of an eyelid convinced the Admiral that he had hit the right nerve. Do you know what this is? Not be, despite himself, found a strange object before his eyes, a sort of small metal cylinder. You can talk, you know. It's just a question that no doubt goes beyond the need to keep your identity secret. I don't know anything, tell me about, if you want. Archer looked him straight in the eyes. So you also have the gift of speech. Well, I'll answer you straight away. I haven't the faintest idea of how it works. It's proven resistant to any analysis. But the only thing that what we know for sure is that is a Suliban artifact. One of the very few things we managed to recover from their raids. It's all very interesting. Thank you, Captain. Now will you take me on a visit to the ship? Maybe later. Archer pointed the object at Notby. If you want to intimidate me with weapons, I can tell you are wasting your time. You said it right, time. The Admiral spread his arms and smiled at Notby. You see, all we know is that this thing lights up when pointed at an organism that has traveled through time. And the more it lights up, the more the subject will be a habitué of this unusual practice. A very useful accessory for a soldier engaged in a temporal war, don't you think? Archer touched the base of the small cylinder with a finger and it immediately released a light so intense that forced those present to cover their eyes. You amaze me, sir. Archer touched the invisible switch again, turning off the object. From what I see. The ship shook violently and the Admiral nearly fell to the floor. The lights in the room began to flicker for a few seconds. Archer had time to see the last glimmers of a teleporter. The man had disappeared. Not B is on board, Captain. Kirk smiled dramatically at Scott's words. Getting up almost abruptly from the command chair, he made an unmistakable sign to Sulu who, without waiting any longer, brought the Kobayashi Maru back on course for the Romulan territories. Fifteen minutes later McCoy, leaning absent-mindedly against a console, observed the young commander of the ship, barely keeping himself from opening his mouth. Spock, the old Spock, observed amused. Doctor. It is not difficult to understand that you want to give a personal contribution to the interpretation of what happened. Perhaps you will be pleased to know, first of all, that Captain Notby is in excellent health and will join us on the bridge soon. Buntum. Chekhov carelessly spoke up. We had all the reports live from the infirmary, the Mediva. McCoy incinerated him with a look, and the Russian quickly went back to other things, leaving the speech halfway. The doctor returned to his initial prey. Jim, my dear friend, you and this bunch of madmen have just risked blowing up a Federation ship, or rather, the first warp ship to be called Enterprise. Kirk looked at him, feigning extreme nonchalance. Leonard, it was a calculated risk, and we were successful. What is calculated in an unprecedented action? McCoy practically shouted. You detonated a photon torpedo, teleported to crazy distances with that magical beam of the Scottish elf a few tens of meters from the hull of that old wrecked museum worthy. But do you know how many things could go wrong? Sorry, Doctor. Scott's voice from the engine room continued to arrive croaking and disturbed on the bridge. There isn't a great tradition of elves in Scotland, perhaps you are referring to Ireland. To tell the truth, Chief Engineer, the Doctor isn't entirely wrong. McCoy turned his head towards the old Spock, 
incredulous at the idea that the latter could support an opinion of his. In fact, those we define as elves are part of mythologies born and developed in Brittany, although they quickly spread, having wide popular resonance in England and Scotland. Already in the 10th century, I, I, McCoy was almost shaking, red faced and paralyzed with anger. You, Leonard, need to sleep. You seem really too tired. To bed, doctor. That's an order. Now helpless, the doctor seemed to sag and, sadly, headed towards his quarters. Calm returned to the bridge. Kirk. The first officer had approached the command post and whispered in the captain's ear. I really believe that you two must obey your own order. Kirk nodded his head and, after leaving the command to the young Spock, he retired to the cabin, suddenly falling asleep. The NX-01A Enterprise's life support had power for months, but it would only be a few hours before the arrival of a recovery ship, already on its way to intercept. Archer took note that all the recording systems on board had been irremediably destroyed by overloads caused by the explosion that had hit them. The nature of the detonation itself could not be supported by any direct detection. Archer, disconsolate, observed the fruitless recovery attempts by the computer personnel, Regretting the absence of Captain Tapol on a diplomatic mission to Vulcan. She can think outside the box, a formidable weapon for a Vulcan. Admiral? Ensign Godservant was fearful. I, I think have found a curious match. Excellent, Ensign. Explain to me what you mean. Archer said, looking him straight in the eyes. Trying not to stutter, the young man began to speak slowly, almost pronouncing the words. Well... Some sensors on the hull are still able to analyze the composition of the surrounding space. In the area of the engine nacelles they reveal traces of annihilated antimatter atoms. This makes we think of a bomb exploding, it's not a surprise. Yes, Admiral, but... Godservant repressed a sob. There are also clear signs of various metal alloys in percentage between them, so to speak. Curious. You're making me tired, Ensign. Find other adjectives if you want to beat around the bush or get to the point. It's terrestrial. The words came out of the young man's mouth, now terrified. Explain better. Archer looked him up and down. What do you mean by this statement? Well, as you well know, sir, the technology of high-explosive photon torpedoes is a recent thing for the Coalition of Planets, and the project is terrestrial. It's my field, and I know the details well, including the exact composition of the residue of a torpedo exploded in empty space. So what? So what we have analyzed is suspiciously similar to what any device built by the land-based construction sites in Sydney would leave. It would only seem more powerful than the ones we're using, but the increase in power itself doesn't mean a major change in the weapon's design, sir. This is a serious statement, Ensign. It's all we have, Admiral. Archer nodded and, shortly after, found himself thinking aimlessly, his gaze lost in the large screen on the bridge. He was sure that would not get to the bottom of this story, 